good afternoon. This is the July 18 meeting of the uh, Fairfield Harbor Management Commission meeting. Uh, this is Kim Taylor in the um, Sullivan Independence Hall uh, first floor conference room with Jack Hersler, um, Don Hyman, um, Jeff Warren, Bill Perugini, uh, George Harris, Jeff Stedman, um, Brian LeClaire, the Harbor Master, Betty Gabriel, our recording secretary. Uh, on the line is uh, Doug Metchik and Jeff Engborg. Um, and let's get this meeting started by um, having a Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So it's been a while since we got together. Our first uh, order of business this afternoon is to approve the minutes from the May meeting. Uh, unless there are any comments or suggestions, can I have a motion to approve the May minutes? Make a motion. Uh, Jack moves. Seconded. Don, Don seconds. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Okay. So minutes from May approved. All righty. Um, just for those of you on the phone and for the record, uh, we have um, a new uh, constellation of, uh, of, of commissioners here. Uh, Sam Cargill, uh, formerly a commissioner, uh, was invited to join another commission which precluded him from continuing to serve on the Harbor Management Commission. He regretfully um, said goodbye and promised to continue to assist us in any way that he could. Uh, in his place, um, uh, Jeff Warren, who was an alternate, has become a commissioner. And in to take um, uh, Jeff's spot as an alternate, we have George Harris, who is with us uh, this afternoon. So just so everybody knows uh, kind of who we are at this point and, and, um, and, and who the players are. Um, so, are there any questions about the changes? Okay. So, moving right along to the chairman's report. Uh, this goes back to um, activities in uh, before our May meeting on May 21st. Um, I represented the uh, commission at the Pequot Yacht Club uh, commissioning ceremony. Um, and the Harbor Commission Chair is always invited to uh, that um, elegant event. Uh, on May 23rd, I received an e we received an email from John Short, who was the chair of the Shellfish Commission, um, agreeing to the language proposed by um, the uh, developers of 1143 Sasco Hill Road, uh, which is at no time shall any motorized vessel, fixed keel sailing vessel, or auxiliary powered sailing vessel be berthed at, moored at, or otherwise secured to the float authorized herein. The restriction shall not apply to human powered vessels, i.e., rowboats, canoes, kayaks, paddle boards, etc., or sail powered vessels without a fixed keel. As you all may recall, um, when the permit was issued by DEEP, um, there, the, there was no um, no uh, mooring of any kind that was uh, to be allowed at the at the dock float, other than kayaks, uh, paddle boards, etc. Um, the developers uh, came back to us, came back to Deep and us, and requested um, additional um, a change in that language, and that is the proposed language that they have requested that we consider. Uh, Deep is waiting for us to agree to that language, um, and we uh, submitted an alternate um, an alternate uh, statement, uh, which did not allow any uh, vessels with any kind of keel, dagger board, etc. Uh, and John Short was responding to our our um, statement that we did not think any. Uh, vessels with dagger boards or keels of any kind be allowed on that dock. So, John, the com Shellfish Commission is saying basically we don't care if there are keels because we dig up the shellfish beds anyway. So it's back to us to decide whether or not we will uh, approve, agree with this language, or if there are other conditions we want to revert to our original 
statement or are there other conditions that we wish to see um, um, it, uh, uh, as part of the permit to develop the dock there on the on the, on the Sesco Hill Road property. On June 6th, uh, I received an email from Betsy Clerk, uh, Town Clerk Betsy Brown, confirming that the land record filing that's required by DEEP um, was in fact filed at the uh, in the town land records, and that's the land record filing is required because we received a permit to do the work at the lower wharf, and part of that. Um, um, condition of receiving that permit is that the land record filing indicate that there is a permit for that work at the lower wharf. And that work is, as you recall, is the repair of the walls, the repair of the dock, um, moving a little of that riprap around, and fixing the uh, cement uh, border, if you will, that goes around the lower wharf property. Um, on June 6th, uh, the commission was copied on an email from Emily Hers of Deep to Peter Walpert at 2206 20, 20, Fairfield Beach Road, sending him a permit to build a 440 dock on South Pine Creek. The 440 dock, if you will recall, is the one where the um, applicant submits plans with an engineering stamp for a um, for residential uh, dock and um, deep pretty much rubber stamps it and sends the permit back and says okay. Um, we were uh, copied uh, several months ago on the um, permit application that Mr. Wolpert filed with the um, with with deep. And then finally on July 7th, um, and we we can discuss this more under. Uh, new business and under the Harbor Master's report, but um, Justin Cathcart, who is a marine manager over at South Pine at um, at uh, uh, South Benson Marina, um, uh, indicated to us that uh, surveyors' costs um, would be covered by the town, and we, the Harbor Commission, didn't have to uh, pay for that. And unless there are any questions, I'm going to go right to the Harbor Master's report. Don. I don't know what a 440 dock is. A 440 dock is uh, an application that's filed to DEEP, and I've got two people here who probably know more than I do about is, this. Is it a will... type of dock? No, it's a type of application. Thank you. That's all I need to know. Right? Am I right on that, Devin? You're correct. As a limitation, it can't go out to deep than four feet of water, nor be longer than 40 feet. And it's, it's only residential, correct? You can, correct? Only residents can do it, and and w can't nobody be over, can't be over wetlands. It's a general permit. It's supposed to be a simpler process without public notice, but it has to fit within the, the boxes of those. Uh, and that's why we didn't ever comment on it because, right? Because it has an engineering stamp on it and it goes to deep, and then they say okay. So we never commented on it. We just got notice that they had done that. Thank you. Okay. Any other? So what's the criteria again? Within four feet, you can't go into deeper than four feet of water. It can't extend more than forty feet beyond mean high water. The pier can't be wider than four feet. The dock can't be bigger than hundred square feet. They can't go over wetlands. Okay. Um, Mr. Harbormaster. Um, since what I said about the surveyor's uh, bill makes no sense to anybody, perhaps you could open your report with a direct uh, reason why that matters. Thank you. Yeah, I have a lot to report. Thank you. The first is uh, the surveyor's bill. So we had a uh, what I classified and determined to be a derelict vessel appear off of Southport uh, last month. Uh, we got a call from the Marine unit that on a weeknight, a windy weeknight, uh, a resident called 911 because it was a 23-foot sailboat with a mast light on, anchored and bouncing an awful lot. Something looked wrong. It was anchored in a spot where you would never anchor offshore. So the police responded and found the boat uh, with a fishing pole on the water, the light on, and no one on the boat. So they were concerned at that point why nobody was on the boat, why it was anchored. And it was dragging a bit. It was not securely anchored. So they, uh, they towed the boat into the harbor for us. Uh, for safety, and then uh, went looking for the owner. They found him, uh, I think it was the next day, they did the good police work, and found that the boat was registered in New York to an abandoned building. A homeless gentleman had purchased the boat, uh, decided he was going to go to Maine with it. Did stop in Norwalk two days prior, that's how they tracked him down, because of an, a uh, an Amazon package. 
They found him. The rudder fell. The engine was seized. The rudder fell off off of Southport. The sails were tattered, so that's where he gave up. Through the anchor, he and his dog jumped on a float, and luckily the winds were blowing strong enough to blow him ashore at South Pine Creek. So he took an Uber to the bus, and they found him on a bus going to Tennessee, not coming back. So that's the, the good news is there, we, they found the gentleman. The bad news is it was uh, he abandoned the boat. The good news is it's beyond abandoned. I declared it derelict under the state statutes, which is a much shorter process to get rid of it. Derelict meaning it's not going to continue to float without extraordinary efforts. This thing had holes in the deck. Uh, it had water-filled cockpit. Uh, the rigging was going to rip right out of the chain plates. They were moving. It was not structurally safe. So we had to. Uh, I had to get a survey, order a survey. So in order to save money, I took the pictures of the boat, sent them to a surveyor. For $210, he gave me a letter saying it's zero value. As long as it's worth less than $2,000, I can order it destroyed immediately. After notice to him, well, the police sent the notice out as required. We did all those steps over a few days. So as of last week, a, the town, uh, well, the police also towed the boat back to Fairfield for us. It got it out of the harbor because they didn't want it sinking in the harbor. It's better sinking in South Benson next to the ramp where they keep the, uh, the fire boat used to be sitting in the harbor where it would be very expensive to haul it out. They hauled it out, put it into it, chopped it up, put it into a dumpster, and it's, it's now gone. So that, that is the good news. Something you have to think about as a commission on a go forward because there's a thousand of these boats over the last eight years throughout Connecticut that have been stuck with towns and marinas that people abandoned. They give up a lot of wooden boats, a lot of fiberglass boats, old boats where the engines go. The people just give up and just leave the boat wherever it happens to be. So that, that can be very expensive if you have to do an auction and a notice and get it out of the water. Uh, so just something we may want to have a budget line item and, and the town as well for them to, in case it goes to South Benson. So that resolved successfully. Uh, I went to the commissioning at the Yacht Club as, as well uh, as the chairwoman. Uh, I attended a safety lecture. The, uh, the Yacht Club invited me to their safety <coughs> staff training uh, of their uh, uh, young men and women who are involved with the youth sailing program, so I gave a little talk to them about harbor safety and rules and, and the conduct we expect uh, them to abide by in the harbor. Uh, John Dean, our deputy harbor master, who's here, and I both attended the safety drill, and we observed the safety drill, uh, and that is a simulated crisis offshore during youth sailing with people injured and in the water and multiple scenarios at once. Fairfield Police and Fairfield Fire both responded with their vessels, as well as the yacht clubs. We got to watch, and then we had a post a briefing after. AMR was also there with the ambulance. And we learned a couple of valuable things. You know, this year in particular, how VHF, we're at a dead spot of VHF as we leave the lower wharf. And there was a big communications issue between the police boat coming from Penfield and some of the boats in the water that it was very spotty VHF service. There needs to be a repeater someday because uh, you just couldn't hear conversations. You could be next to the boat and we couldn't hear each other. So that's a little bit of a, a, uh, an issue. Uh, but it went well. The staff did a great job at Pequot. Police and fire did a great job responding. I yeah, feel good about the, the resources and how well-trained the Pequot uh, staff is for handling these situations. Uh, blessing of the Fleet, John and I went to that. Uh, as you know, the parade was postponed, but we went forward with the blessing. Uh, because we're going to get wet anyway. It's getting sprayed by the hose, so a few spritzes wouldn't damper anyone's spirits, nor did it. There was probably 50 boats there. It was a very nice event. We came up with a new system this year. We tweaked it a little more with two police boats and my boat. They kept things moving very nicely, very much in order, no difficulties at all, so that was nice. Uh, no update on Perry Green. Okay, sure. Uh, there was a very large log probably 20 feet long, found in the harbor. The yacht club was kind enough to tow it out when they found it to the yacht yard, and then I had public works come with the equipment and get rid of it. Uh, so that was resolved. Uh, John and I went out uh, this past weekend, and we took an inventory of all the vessels at the moorings to see who was there. Good news is everyone's at the right mooring, finally. <laughs> <laughs> or more or less the right mooring. There's two boats four boats actually that have always been in the incorrect. They flipped each other. I've spoken to them last year. They don't seem to care. They like their spots. So as long as they're happy, you know, everything is good. <laughs> they got used to being in the wrong spot next to each other. Uh, John and I also went up, did a patrol up uh, 
Pine Creek, uh, and all the way in the Inner Harbor, all the way in. Uh, went, we, uh, uh, there were a couple of boats who were displaced from their docks by the property owner this year who we spoke with who wanted priority on harbor moorings and they of course can't get them if they're you know unless they're repairing and they were not so that's been resolved uh i went to the shellfish commission's clam clinic that they had at sasco uh, in your harbor management area and boy there's a lot of people there hundreds of people on a cloudy misty day clamming it was quite nice to see all the folks out enjoying that resource we have with the shellfish there uh, I'm pleased to report that uh, I, when we were on patrol last Saturday, we saw a photographer with a very large camera very intently photographing. It turns out our eagles have had offspring, and there are now two baby eagles in the harbor, which is great news, means they're propagating themselves, and there are no babies uh, who uh, were right by the Tide Mill buildings. So the little... Is the nest up there? Apparently, yes. Yeah. Tide Mill. Yeah. The nest is in a tree uh, south of the Ravis offspring. And they hang out. I guess the babies like hanging out by Tide Mill, and they're they don't have white heads yet. I'm told they're brown at this point. But it's exciting to have offspring because they try, and they're trying. I guess and it's good to have an eagle population. Hopefully, with no more accidents because of the eagles, like last year. So one step that we had an accident in the harbor because of an eagle uh, sighting. A, a sailboat got distracted by the eagle and plowed into a moored powerboat, causing significant damage to the powerboat. Believe it or not, he was, he was honest enough to tell me it was the eagle and seemed reasonable. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, the police department's been on patrol a lot in the harbor. You probably see the marine boats. They were out there Saturday with the jet skis. Uh, they've been out there with the bigger boats all the time. As, as I've asked them to spend more time there, and you know, I've invited them to use the uh, little building at Yee Yacht Yard. I cleaned that up as a substation if they're out or they wanted to stop for a while. So they've been out there a, a, a lot, and they gave me a call last Friday morning early. They went to the Inner Harbor at high tide, like 9 o'clock, and a dock was being installed, and we had no permit or no records. So I took pictures, reached out to Deep, they weren't sure what, it, what that what was going on. It turns out it was just a replacement of a dock, and Deep determined that while there was never a ramp to the dock in the last couple of years, I've been harbor master. A permit from the 1980s did have that ramp that they took away years ago, so it did not require even a certificate of permission or anything. It, it was fine just to put the same dock back in with the same ramp. So that's good. They're keeping an eye on stuff as it happens because we can't be out there all the time. Uh, that said, I, uh, I did send a letter and I copied the chairman to the police chief and the chairman of the police commission uh, complimenting officers uh, at Tara Fay and Perham uh, who've been out there at the, uh, the safety activities, the blessing of the fleet, routine patrols. They've done a great job uh, and we should be very proud of the, the work they're doing as a police unit, keeping everyone safe out there and actively coming to Southport a lot now as part of their patrol loops. <coughs> things out. So that is, that is very good. And I wanted to get that in their their files complimenting the guys. And finally, Lower Wharf. I had a conversation with Jim Ryan. Uh, Bessie was kind enough to, to initiate the conversation with the folks at Public Works. I talked to Jim Ryan today about the uh, existing uh, dock at the Lower Wharf, the one that was damaged in the December storm where the ramp came out. Public Works can assist us in getting the decking part off the top of it. They questioned about the bottom, whether they would, they questioned two things. One is, were those pilings pressure treated? If so, you know, they, they thought that might be a concern disposing them, uh, where to put them, because they won't, they're not taken at landfills, they said, uh, or if they have creosote on them. Uh, and they were also concerned, they, weren't, they didn't know how to get them out. Uh, whether, uh, you know, and I said, I think you pound the top and jiggle them, but they don't have equipment to do that, they have a backhoe. Uh, we, they, I did suggest that perhaps, and it's up to Devin, you know, his thoughts and, and Jeff, whether you cut them at ground level just to get them out of the way. We have an extra buoy we can put there if necessary to keep boats away, but does that pose a problem when you put the new ones in? In the future, if you leave little stubs flush with the ground, are we better leaving the pilings up and just taking at least the dock off that before it falls over or someone gets hurt on it? And that would allow the fishermen, hopefully, to get back out again. But anyways, he, I, I told him I would pass that on to the commission and then you folks, you know, to the chairman, to reach out to him, whatever you want done, if anything, to uh, to remove the old structure. But they're glad to help us do that. And if you have any questions, please. 
Just to clarify, because this relates to what I'm going to say. Yeah. So DPW will remove the, the flooring, if you will, from the piers? Yeah, the whole anything attached to the piers, the table, the, 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 I call it the decking, the dock, decking. the structure, not the yeah. pilings. So, so we'll remove the pilings. So to walk on it. Let's no, to walk on it. Be. <coughs> and if we wanted them, <coughs> yeah, go ahead. I guess if we wanted to cut the pilings off at ground level, uh, we talked about it. They said they guess they can do that, but I guess, I don't know. When we put the new one in to, to Devon, do we have to put the pilings in the exact same? Yeah, they don't necessarily be in the exact same place, but it'd be harder to pull out once well, we cut the tops off. Yeah. Them off. Do we have to take them out the old ones? What's that? Do you have to take them out? Not just necessarily, it but it could, it could be. It could cause experiences. Uh, are they hard to come out in your experience? If you no, no, not usually not the older one. I usually don't want to put it that deeply. Okay. Um, so I think they could be pulled out relatively easily with the equipment that we need to go to drive the new piles. So now with a bucket hoe or backhoe from land, but actually probably a contract. You, you could try it, but I don't, I don't know if it would be successful. Um, you could, you'd be a little concerned with the wall if you were lowering the wall trying to pull them up. Um, so it, it depends how badly you want to get the stuff out out of there. Um, I'd probably be inclined to, to leave the piles anyway until the marine contractor can pull them with the, with the same equipment they used to drive. But if you want to get them out, yeah, you can cut them, cut them in a little water. That's another option too is getting you know going out to bid. I don't know if we have a bid list for marine contractors already. We can go off of. State bid list or not? I'm not aware. I'm not aware of a bid of a bid list, but are are you done with your? I'm report? done. I'm done. Okay. Yeah, okay. So maybe <laughs> since since our town engineer has just joined us, thank you, Mr. Hurley. Um, we can we can fast forward our conversation to a discussion of what do we do with the pier at the lower wharf, since DPW has indicated an interest or a willingness to take the the, the top part off. The deck. The deck. Right. The question is, well, the first question before the commission is, do we want to do we want to do that? Number one. Then the next question is, if we want to do that, what do we want to do about the pilings? And I, I guess, I mean, Devin has already opined that we can take them out if we want to. We have deep's permission. It might That's be a little bit, little bit different than I thought. I'm going back now again. What I'm going to describe was in the '90s. At South Benson Marina, we had a dock that was defunct, so to speak, very similar to Lower Wharf, and we were able to get permission to redo it because there were a couple of pieces left of that dock. So we said it was replacement of an existing dock. Right. That if we had taken all the piles out, and the example, the best example I can think of might be for zoning, uh, where. If you have a big you know, gas station or a big McDonald's sign, you take it down and now the new place comes in two years later, you don't get to put that sign back. You have to meet. Right. You know. But we already have the permit. We already have the permit to do the work at the lower wharf. At the lower wharf. Correct. Okay. So we that can. Was, that was critical. Yeah. I wasn't 100% yeah. sure if it was. If yes. It was. I know we applied for it. Yes, so we've we got it. Get it. Okay. We've so got it. That, yeah. Because you want at least something in writing saying the permit to replace that, then that's a whole different story. Because without that, taking it down, you run the risk of you might not be called grandfathered. Right. But if we have a permit, and the permit's good, I think, for five years? Yeah, it's good for five years. It was issued this okay. And if I recall, the uh, boards approved the funding uh, for it, again, in the hopes that we were going to go for a ship grant. But if not, according to our um, finance director, they still approved it. It wasn't a condition of the grant. Right. Then if we assume that we're going to get it within five years, then there's really minimal risk on that. I just didn't know we actually had the permit on that. So thanks for clearing that. Yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> so is there any, so, so Bill, we don't, I, at least I don't, and I'm not sure if other commissioners kind of understand, how, do the departments work together? Does engineering have to get involved? Can we just go straight to DPW? Is there, do we have to pay, is there a fee that's associated with having DPW do the work that the commission would be responsible for? Um, on that case, because I don't think it's going to involve any engineering, if it's just removal, it's going to just be 
men and equipment, if you don't know. Okay. Then it would be directly with the DPW. Okay. Uh, I would probably suggest that you had John Cattell would probably be the one to talk to on that. And then whether they would just do it, whether if there was no time limit, you know, not that there's too many lulls in our DPW right. schedule. Life. But on occasion there might be one and then they could do it. Maybe there's no charge or they may say, well, we'll have to charge it. That's strictly between okay. them and them. them yeah, know, okay. For that. Uh, as far as I know, again, having the permit in place, uh, place uh, basically then you're basically starting the work, right, by dismantling it, or <laughs> do we kind of get the payment yeah, going, or do we have to get permission to remove the structure? I mean, I think removal is part of the project. Yeah. You have five years to complete the project. But don't Maybe you usually have to notify when you're, quote, starting the yeah, project? Yeah, you have to notify for starting construction. So we could just say we're... For safety reasons, we're notifying the DEP that we are starting the removal of the pier, yeah. and, and we hope sometime in the spring or next year to do the construction. I, 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 would, I would make it crystal clear what, oh. what, what we're doing, just, just oh, like okay. you said, because when you when you prepare these permit applications, you have to offer some level of schedule and construction methodology, which is um, an estimate. Uh, at our point, before the funding is secured, before contractors are secured, so you kind of basing it on our experience, and I don't, I don't recall what we put in as a duration of the project, but we didn't put in the five year. So I think just to, to paraphrase what Bill said, something of that effect of with with the notification, the start of work notification, notification going into the state saying, hey, we're doing this demo, but the construction is is to follow at a later point within our uh, permit window. Don? Can we talk about timing for the, the when the deck would be removed and perhaps the pilings? I imagine it would be in 23, perhaps after the end of the I, I, season. I think what Bill is suggesting is it really will depend on, on DPW's schedule and what else they've got going on. We haven't had that yet. And we had, and we, we've, the harbor master has had a very preliminary conversation with with some folks about whether or not it would be possible, and that's that's kind of where we are at this moment. So, but it sounds like from what Devin is saying, we'd have to let Deep know that we're taking it down for safety reasons, I, and I, I we don't have the money to do the rest of the work yet. I think that would be prudent to do. Again, the risk is if you don't get it done within the permanent window, you jeopardize the grandfathering ability. Uh, which is five years. Permit is five Permit years, and yeah. Uh, one of the, one of the things the, the, the core the town doesn't have a core permit yet, and the core has been very for the dredging for the for this for the lower war. Okay. Oh. Now, it the Army Corps has a general permit that that's the blanket permit over the state of Connecticut that has three tiers of notification. One is self-verification, one is pre-construction notification, one is individual permit. This type of activity is self-verification typically. And, and what used to occur up until probably 12-ish 12, 12 months ago, we send this into the state, we send a copy into the Corps, they send us a letter confirming its eligibility for self-verification. In the last 12 months, turnover with new people the self-verification process is anything but self-verification. It's verification by the Army Corps of Engineers for its conformance for self-verification. <laughs> it used so, to be a rubber stamp, pretty uh, much. If DEP approved it, Army Corps, they were the easiest agency to work with. And like Devin said, in the last 12 months, it changed where they're just taking forever. Everybody I know is having issues where it's six months before they even look at your your stuff that you're submitting. They're so understaffed and whatever, and so it is a lot of frustration there. So, so we, so we don't know how long. How I mean, even if the department DPW was ready, willing, and able to do the work, we really can't proceed until we get the the well, okay from the core. It would comply with self-verification. Yeah. So you would say you no, know, we're. In conformance with self verification, but you wouldn't get concurrence from the Army Corps that they agree with that self verification. Now, because this, this kind of split and how they're looking at things is so new, I don't know how that would be. Um, 
arbitrated, if, if at all. I don't know that they would care. So right now, we, we're, we followed back up for the core and we resent the COP to the core for their, for their review of concurrence. So they already have the permit. They, they had it when this went into the state. They misplaced it. They have it again. Um, it, it's a, frankly, it's a mess up there. Yeah. So I guess one of the questions then is, dare we, is, is there any risk whatsoever that if we don't wait until the Corps has given us their okay, that our dredging project is in any way jeopardized, that we annoy the Corps so badly that they then... Well, why not just wait until we get the approval from the Corps? If well, because I think we're saying that that... After this voting season in, in the fall, maybe. Well, I guess, I guess that's what the question is. Do we... Do we I'm, for the commissioners to bill. You could, um, the deck portion, correct me if I'm wrong, the deck portion you probably could remove without a permit because you're above and you're not in water. It was the actual removal of the pile. Uh, technically, it's in the air draft over, over yeah. water as well. Yeah. So, oh, okay. That's what I but, but again, the self verification would, would say that we can do this, these small stuff, this bit of minor work. I, my concern about the decking is that a uh, safety issue for children. And I, and I just feel like that should be a prior. Whatever we decide to do with respect to the pilings, I feel like we have an obligation to think about kids jumping from the, from the land onto the decrepit deck. Yeah. I think part of the rationale for removal was, was to see whether we really need this deck and dock at all. Because it, the reason for its existence is, is not really that apparent to me. I mean, it's like a handful of people to fish from it. Other than that, there's no reason to have it. Um, it's just it's just in the way, and, and the people who fish could fish as, just as easily from the land part of the and So my, my thing was, if we got rid of it, people might decide, well, we don't even need it. Now, there's a significant expense to the town for this, even with the funding that's been, been lined up. Um, and so if we don't, if it's, if it's not there and we discover the fishermen are just as happy fishing from the from the wall as they were from the dock, and why even bother to rebuild it? Yeah, I think that's this is this is Doug talking. Can I can I just ask a question because I was having a hard time hearing it. I, I think it was Jack speaking before. Jack, were you saying that um, you had a bit of a safety concern about leaving the deck in place because people either by land or by water were trying to access it and use it and could get injured? Yeah, I guess my concern is we're sort of balancing a technical question about whether we're in compliance with the Army Corps' approval of the state. Uh, agreement and and it's it's not clear whether we should be doing anything right now. I mean, the flip side of it, I was just pointing out that you know it's the summertime. There's more kids out using the harbor right now. To the extent we could get DPW to remove the decking part sooner than later, it would remove the town's and the commission's concern about safety issues. That was my only point. I, I'm also yeah, so, so not wanting to antagonize the Army Corps when yeah. we're trying to do our dredging. Uh, well, so uh, anyway, so so thanks for that clarification. I want to just convey my, my agreement with you on that, which is well across the board. Obviously, not wanting to antagonize the or anything, but we have the opportunity to remove the deck, and we think it's a safety hazard by remaining in place. I, I think it's something that we should strongly consider. The other thing I just want to throw in there is, I do think, regardless of whether the pilings are in there or not. Um, sure, it could be an expensive proposition for somebody to fish by, but taking it out and having people fish off the, um, what I'll just call the end of the warfare landing, without any protective railings with rocks below with other things, I'm, I'm not sure that, that as an alternative to people fishing from a future deck at some point in time, that doing it right from that edge in its current form is the safest thing either. Devin, did you have? Um, well, but but Doug mentioned. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. If you want to pull the deck, I think it's a pretty low risk proposition okay. that I do think is fully compliant with self verification. If if you wanted to be sure, we wanted to be sure we could email the core to say the, this minor activity is going to occur while you're reviewing the. Um, yeah, for safety, okay, yeah. Yeah, it was drastic. I agree. The part of the part of it collapsed already. And we're about right. The rest of it. Right. 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 Right.
Right, right. Jeff? Just a couple of things. Uh, your, your comment, Jeff, I, I understand it. My, my feeling is that it's an historic structure and it's an amenity for the public and that the, the goal should be to retain it. Uh, but that, that's just my opinion. The, the other thing is that we don't have permission yet to put to put in the North Pier back. We were going to discuss that. Correct. So with respect to Bill's comments, if we remove something, does that preclude us, and we don't have permission you know, now to put it back, does that preclude us getting permission uh, to, to do that? Uh, so those were the two, two comments that okay. I had. It's it certainly changed the process that it needs to be authorized from. But I think I think there's a, maybe too many unknowns here. We have to get a few knowns down. If, and if so some of the benefit of uh, or we bolstered the case for the reconstruction of the T head back when we got that permit a decade or so ago, because the existing structure was still in place. It wasn't a slam dunk. It wasn't. Uh, as of right or anything, but it, it helped the cause. Um, I, I I think it would make sense to make sure you have a plan of action before you start dismantling things for fear that you don't let firm lapse and have nothing. Yeah. Um, I think the, the point is, is valid of if you're going to say you're going to fish on an open edge with no handrails, I that, think that, that, that's a bit of a, a potential safety concern. And what I know of fishing pier design, they don't they don't like to land fish on, in the dry. So at low tide, the, 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 you wouldn't have water right in front of where you're fishing. Um, so the fish are going to be skipping along the sure beach are coming up to you. Um, so from a fishing pier perspective, I'm not sure that working right off the edge is, is uh, ideal. Should, should we also bring this to the attention of the Historic District Commission if we're going to remove the structure in its entirety? Well, I think, Jack, <laughs> yes? I was going to propose that we take this in chunks. So the first chunk would be to talk to DPW about the removal of the deck. Then to do a fuller investigation of what would be involved with potentially removing the pilings. Because once we have more data about whether that's even feasible for them to do with the equipment that they have, we'll either know it's possible or not possible for that to even happen. And if it's not going to be possible for them to do it, that sort of makes it clear that we're going to be looking at using a contractor with the skills and equipment to do that. So that would be further down the road. But we don't have we don't have enough information yet to know definitively what the town is means to do it. Right. We don't know any we don't know we don't know what's involved with removing the piles. We don't know right. what it takes, we don't know what it would cost. Well, we if do anything. Know they think they could remove the deck. Right. Well, I would I would say if you if you're talking about pulling the piles and extracting them, I don't think DPW would have that equipment. Okay. I don't think you'd want them to try to put an excavator pads down right on the edge of a seawall we know is tenuous. And try and pull against that. Yeah. So I think you're talking about crane to do that work. It's just when you when you drive the new piles, you're going to have the crane there anyway. So the, the removal reinstallation is part of an overall project. It's not that big a deal. It's just the spacing component of it. There have been discussions about is there some benefit to the fishermen by reducing the height of the existing pilings, which perhaps DPW could do without cutting them down at the seabed level. That's just Right, so when they cast, they're not whacking into the pilings. Right, but, but it's going to be at the again. Low. That would be more, even if that's possible from a, from a regulatory standpoint. Is that something that we want to do? Or that they it's do? easy. We, we just we just oversaw the demolition of the Pleasure Beach Bridge, the pulling of several thousand timber piles. It's much easier when when you can grab them above high water, put the hammer on them, and, and, and vibrate them out. We had to grab a whole bunch of, of deadhead piles that were about a foot above mud line that were below low water. So that involved divers coming in and putting uh, oh. chokers on the, on the piles and not having the hammer to help break them free. So it, it can all be done. Um, sure. The easiest way of it being done is to do it at the time of the construction. If, if you don't want to or can't, then at least we wouldn't have divers here if it's all in the dry. So if you, if you, if you cut on a mud line, you can grab them later. So, so take the hammer. So to take the decking off, 
is, is kind, of, that's kind of where that leaves us. Do we want to take the decking off? Do you want a motion? Well, I, I, I want everybody's kind of questions and thoughts to be considered, and then, yeah, I think we need a motion. But, I mean, I, I guess, are there any other questions? I mean, we, we're concerned about safety. See, that's why we, re we would remove the decking to deter jumping onto it. Yeah. The kids might just do an Yeah, and, and this is, this is Doug, I'd like to just ask one yep. more question, too. I know yep. we don't know whether DPD, DPW would remove the pilings or not, but in removing the pilings, are we talking about basically cutting them down to, you know, some lower portion than they are and removing them? Or are we talking about some kind of, you know, total removal? I don't think we know, Doug. I think that's part of the problem. Devin was, I don't know if you heard Devin saying that at Pleasure Beach Bridge, um, some of the pilings were underwater and they had to send divers down, um, which get, you know, makes the, the demolition part of the project much more expensive. Um, and we don't, he didn't think that DPW had the equipment necessary to pull the pilings, maybe to cut them off. Um, yeah. But, you know, cutting them off still leaves questions, navigation questions, as well as as uh, fishermen questions. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know what the value of that is to just cut, cut them off. Right. Jeff? Yeah, although, well, cut, well, cutting them off at, you know, at, at low tide or mean low tide or something would present less of a hazard and could still be above surface water. But I, I guess my take is, and apologies for being on the phone and not in the room, that um, I'd be an advocate for removing the deck and exploring if DPW could also remove the pilings in whatever, you know, recommended form they give. I'm assuming it wouldn't be a full-blown, you know, remove the pilings all the way down to what's driven in. Uh, that would be part of a different project. Yeah, I, 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 we don't know. We, we, you know, Devin didn't think that they had the equipment to do that, that part of it. Remove all the, remove the, pull the whole piling out. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing yeah. Doug talking with the town risk manager. So, is it was it the risk manager's assessment that it's appropriate to remove for, for public safety purposes that removal of the death would be? I just I spoke with the risk manager today. Uh, <clears throat> he sees it as a big risk. At a minimum, he, he wanted more signage. Uh, I'm sure he'd be delighted to see the death removed. I'm sure that would be the case. One thing I'll offer too is if you're looking at risks from both sides, if, if, if you remove the guardrail and the decking and the caps and leave the piles, you're going to create a navigation risk um, because those piles would be maybe maybe just above mean high water, maybe. Um, so you probably can't. As I'm thinking about this, I think you you would need to cut the piles and mud line. To, to, to do that, to, to check both risks. Otherwise, you're trading one risk for another. Yeah. But if we left them the way they are, they're way above, right? I don't know about way. I'm yeah. trying to remember. They're always, they're always, they're always good. How, oh, how much is... That dock is never underwater. Yeah. And the only time it could be underwater is... Well, lower warp would have to have these. But the, pi the, piles, the, the piles are cut off below the top of the deck, though. So the piles are down. I see. You're saying they're at the bottom of it. Yeah, they're at the bottom of the deck. But they still don't offer much visibility. If they're, right. if they're 12 inches above the water line, they still are. All right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, I think they should be marked or flagged in some other manner. We can't put we can't put a buoy or buoys there. We have one buoy already in surplus. It's a, you know, the, the danger yeah. ones we have with the speed coming yeah. in. We have a danger one we can stick there. But just one, and there how many piles? Six? Oh, no, I know. We just keep, I mean, both aren't going to, you know, you wouldn't. Seems like the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. So I think it's fine to just leave it as is. Yeah. Who knows what the cost will be? The, you know, can I ask a little question? Out. Bill, have you, have you looked at the structure at the top of this thing, the whole thing collapsing? Even we lost part of it already with just one big storm. That, we, we also don't want it landing in the harbor, blocking the harbor, or running a drift either out where a boat can hit it in the sound and get severely damaged. Uh, I think it's, it's separate now because the whole separate Correct. thing that connected is, is out. Uh, and uh, the wall, there's other parts of the wall that are in worse shape for it, so that I haven't looked at the actual connection, but uh, I know uh, there's a couple spots. Um, 
that the uh, cap is all cracked. Well, not the wall. I'm talking about the, the deck itself. Oh, the, the actual deck itself. on there? Yeah, since it came down, I, I haven't been out on it. Jeff? Jeff? I, I don't have the deed with me, but it might be a good idea before doing, making a decision to do anything there to just inform the Sasquatch group that you're doing it because I believe they're identified in the deed as having an advisory role or, or to, be, to be involved in decisions, although the, the commission is responsible for the management of it. This is a really small picture that I'm looking at here, but there's large pilings on the outward side of, of the existing... Yeah, those are the fender piles, the old fender piles. Yeah, and those we would not be taking down either, right? So those are the most seaward, the most waterward structures. You could, you could leave those. Yeah, well, that's, you'd have to, in a boat, you'd have to get past those to get to the ones that are holding up the, uh, yeah. the dock. So, so there, it's not like there wouldn't be something very so difficult to vote. It's, so those are on the those are on the the country club side of the pier. Yeah, here yeah, are those yeah, the yeah, pier. yeah. I'm looking at the yeah, small mine, picture, mine print, right? yeah. yeah. But that it's not with the buoy plus those there. I mean, it would be hard to get to the piers without. The, I mean, I'm looking at the deck. The deck looks like it's three or four feet. I'm not trying to. The, the deck that we'd be removing there is it's got a piling in front of it that's four feet higher than it. Yeah. Well, we're just, we're just commit to call the pilot from up on and grab them later. Commissioner's thoughts? I kind of agree with what Bill said before that after this discussion, I think maybe we should just leave it alone. Just leave it alone? Yeah. We can we can certainly we can leave it alone we can we can leave it alone for the time we can certainly explore with DPW what they can do what it would take what it would cost we can notify Sasquanog that we're considering this how do they feel about it um, leave it as is and collect more information so we have more more and, uh, Jeff and in the meantime we make a decision about what to do about the northern the uh, pilings and whether to request the, the approval from Deep to restore them. Well, that's that going to be a separate. That's next. Right. Yeah. If if you look at that, the the pilings closest, they, they kind of form a, a wall. Uh, if you remove. Yeah, that's the the ones on the outside on the country club side of the of the pier are significantly higher. Right. Yeah, this yeah. is a high tide picture. Yeah. And yeah, both, you have to get those before you can get to the other. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So do we want to postpone any further discussion of this till our next meeting and will the harbor master can chat with DPW and Betty can help us with that and we can we can chat with Sasquanog right. and um, and come back with more information in August and uh, I mean I don't know that it's likely that DPW could have gotten to this effort before then anyway you think they might have been able to so the Sasquatch question is just about the deck itself and the piling removal, or I think so. I think we would simply the tell them what, question. yeah, the demolition question. Ask them versus just advising them what we're doing, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If that's if that's sufficient, that we just advise them as opposed to needing the the full organization approval. Uh, Chairwoman, I suppose one other thing that in, in the interim you could block off the section where the landing connected to it. Just continue to guard rail around so there's no easy way to climb up on it. It's missing from the corner so they would have to you know, make an L shape. Right. Know, upright decking stuff. Did the risk manager ma management people did they think uh, oh, they just wanted signs? They weren't the recommendation was to have structural engineer evaluate the extent of damage. Right. Number two, install temporary signage stating, quote, danger, pier closed due to storm damage. Right. And we've seen the, some signs there. But in your conversations today or recently, were they thinking of anything other than signage? No. But I didn't bring it up. Everything he said would lead me to believe that he would be comfortable with removing, with making it safer, making it safer. Right. 
would involve removing the, the deck. The deck. What Brian is suggesting, the harbor master is suggesting, was build in that where the pier, where the where the the ramp to land used to be, closing that off with more um, fencing, if you will, yeah. Yeah. so that nobody could climb aboard. Jump across. Yeah. Yeah. I. I uh, I would suspect he would support it, but I can't yeah. speak for him. Yeah. Yeah. So since everybody is undecided about which is worse, which is the greater safety risk, why don't we why don't we put it on the agenda for our August meeting and do a little more fact finding in the interim, and um, uh, folks can uh, think about it over the course of the next few weeks, and um, hopefully we can reach a decision. I, I, I think it's, it's safe to say that Jeff has um, determined that there will be no ship grant funding uh, in 2023, for sure. So there's no work that can be done, no project work vis-a-vis uh, -vis the permit that can be done until the winter of 2025 or early, late, late, late 2024. So, I mean, this is a situation that will be with us um, for some time. So, okay. Um, moving along to the first agenda item under old business, uh, lower wharf repairs. Um, Mr. Mr. Santa and, and Mr. Stedman, we have a permit that does not cover the work on the northern pier. We we requested that uh, race go back to deep to see whether or not it would be possible to get permission, their permission, to include work on the northern pier in the permit described, permit work described in the, the permit that we did get. Devin has a report on that. Um, so, Devin, if you want to let us, what? Yeah, after our last, after the meeting where we discussed the, the, the full reconstruction versus partial, I did reach out to the state to ask whether that could be done um, in, in some committed for uh, fashion out of the full application. They, they did say it could be done through uh, a general permit um, for reconstruction. So that, that should be a bit easier. I. This is a new analyst there. I, I'm, I emailed her back to confirm her position on that. Usually, in my experience, that wouldn't comply because it hasn't been serviceable for, it has to be like repaired within the certain date of, of being okay. serviceable, in, in my experience. Um, so we're, we're left with, we, we could respond back the way that she requested and put in a general permit request for construction of that northern section, at which point the town would have two separate authorizations, one COP for the L head and a general permit for the T head. Um, again, the core is kind of following up behind. The core is now reviewing the, the COP for the L head, so we would have to advise them otherwise. Um, or alternatively, we go back for a COP for the full T head. So we're, we can do either. Um, so I guess the question is, what's, as far as, as far as we're concerned in our decision making, what is the difference? I mean, the general permit. I, I have some concerns of the applicability of the general permit. Okay. But I don't, the state, that, that was, I had the conversation with the state, and that was the state's guidance. I don't know if that was just kind of being thrown as a bone. Is okay? This is an easier path for you okay. guys. You guys can do that. Make it clear. I just don't want to see you end up it's getting down to the end of that road and then someone saying, oh, no, it wasn't. So, what you're suggesting is the COP application for the Northern Pier would be a safer route? I, I believe so. But again, it's not. Or, or I, and as soon as, um, as soon as I had the conversation, I reiterated in an email to them, confirming and showing them photos of the current conditions. 
and uh, so if, if you have any different understanding, please let me know. I never heard back. But, okay. But again, it doesn't seem like we're, that any action is going to happen on any of this anytime soon. Correct. Unless we, unless the commission plays a lot of the, 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 the lotto when we win, because we don't, we will not have any money yeah. until through the end of next year. All right. Were you going to give us a, a cost estimate, Devin? Would, would your cost be the same for the additional work, whether it's a general permit or the, or the COP? Um, COP would be a bit more money. But I, I, I can give that to you. Yeah. My thought was if, if, if we take direction from the regulatory agency and they tell us this is what we can do, it would be difficult for. But who, who knows? That, I, I've had them change their tune before. I just don't want to go down past that. And it's also kind of a, it's a bit of a disjointed permit at that point, too, because you're going to have the COP and then the. So, so it would be safer to have it all in one approval. I, I think so, particularly because it's, it's unlikely that this is going to occur on, as one project in the future. Right. Anyway, I think you just kind of want to establish what the project parameters would be and then, then pick off what you might do. So, so maybe you could give an estimate for the next next month's meeting? Yeah. And, and we could vote on it, the commission could vote on it then. Yeah. <clears throat> But it does put us in a tenuous position to tell the state, well, you're wrong. You want to apply for something yeah. different. Well, they pay that. Well, I mean, we're just amateurs. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I could put together an uh, estimated fee for the COP. Thank you. Thank you. Thank we're, we're amateurs, but some of us have been doing this longer than well, the analysts. Have been. I'm speaking for myself. <laughs> More than half the people at Deep have been there less than three years. Wow. Uh, I'll retire. Wow. So, well, so I, I for myself, who people have been dealing with this agency our whole professional careers, see these names we've never heard of before, these interpretations that make no sense to us, and it's uh, a different so, time. So if we went for another for the COP for the northern pier, would they would they push everything together and give us one permit, or no, would they we then have we'd two, have, we have two? two. Separate, we have two separate permits. I, let, let me let me send to, to you, Chairwoman, the, the, the statement of concern I have within the general permit that, that could come back to bite us, and then we can make the determination. Okay. I guess the only reason I'm asking is I'm thinking ahead. If we've got a permit for five years on one project and a permit a different start date. that doesn't that's got another year or two on another project, I mean I don't know if that's good or bad, but we would have two different things on the same get, piece. Of, you, you can get extensions on yeah, one or the other. Right. The, the other thing is that we did when we did the soil test borings, we know that Rock Ledge is more of a concern on the northern right. section as right. well. Right. Right. Um, so again, per, per my recollection, the right. conversations it kind of got taken out of this initial project because of the cost component of it, because of the sort of the stock in this pile. So, well, is that a reason to have a separate permit? Because the the, you know, the rock the ledge and the cost and the we can do part of it anyway, right? You know, we could have well, we're all set to do the L head. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll double check one more time. And it, I suppose this, the safest thing I could do is I, I could point to the section of my concern with the state. And just to, just so you're aware, this has not been serviceable for the X number of years, though it was authorized in 2012. Are you still saying we should go for the general process? Okay. Okay. Because we have time. Okay. Okay. That would be great, Devin. Thank you. Yeah. Respond back. Okay. That that would be great. So we're going to have decisions to make in August. Would they respond to you in writing to that inquiry? Yeah, sure. Yeah. The only thing is, if, if you if you guys said we have a contractor lined up September one, yeah. and we want to get going on the whole thing, in that case, I'd say we'll go. Let's just do the general permit because that's as of right, and that's what they've told us to do. And then pick up pieces on the, on the back end if there are any pieces to pick up. The fact that that's not the case, 
we have time, probably the worst position to be in is be three years down the line or ready to start this whole project and someone say that that's not serviceable. Yeah, that would be terrible. Yeah. That would be terrible. Hold up the L project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To hold everything up. Right. Yeah, that would be terrible. All right, let me, let me get some confirmation from Deep and uh, sign back. Uh, okay. Devin, thank you. That's 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 great. Okay. Any questions from anybody? Uh, just one question. I think yeah, I know sure. the answer, but just to be clear, is the only resource for money for repairing Lower Wharf the ship program that we have no access to? Are there any other places that are at all possible, given the amount of infrastructure money that? I read about being spent elsewhere. Is is that the only bank no, to go we, to? We don't know. It, it, but it's a good question because if the ship grant isn't viable in the future, how are we going to get the money? So we, we haven't researched other grants or asked that anyone in the town. Maybe that's something we should ask now. Or our, perhaps our state legislators. Yeah. It could be COVID money left over, too. I don't know if we've ever inquired at the town. The uh, What do you call that? The um, uh, structure stuff. Mr. Hurley, is there is there any? No, I don't think there's any money. Nothing, nothing infrastructure left over. Yeah, the uh, ARPA, uh, even the ARPA money, they have uh, a waiting list for uh, projects that uh, that would be ahead of this, in my opinion. So I don't, I don't think they. Is it worth it to get on the waiting list? Um, Does that give us more visibility for other, if there's other money that comes up, comes out, comes available? We are having a planning meeting. Um, I think it might be tomorrow. And so we can bring it up as, you know what, we already have the permit in play. Uh, it's three months before the deadline, something falls through, and we need a quick replacement project. At least they'd be on the list. Maybe they would entertain that. That would be right. wonderful. Some of the what shovel, have... shovel yeah, right. project. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Look for You'd have to, you know, put it out to bid. That's why I said the three months or four months, you know, to, to make sure. Do we have an estimate how long it would take to do this? Well, it's in a part, part of the full job. It's not just yeah, here, the, the wall. Yeah, there's um, really three pieces. Uh, maybe like uh, six I, months ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Do you need us to do anything to get our on the to get on the list? No, I, I'll, I'll bring it up uh, tomorrow as, as a possibility of you can just put it on a list of if something falls through, it's just under consideration, and and if they're like, no, no, we've got ten other ones, forget it, okay. or they might say, I'll be like, well, this already has the permit in hand, and uh, I guess it'd be close to having a year bid document. For that, yeah. we we had bid doc documents. Yeah. Well, it depends. We had bid documents for the the, oh, okay. so the wall has change. changed. Yeah. There's some other aspects. We're not currently contracted to do mm -hmm. bid docs, but uh, we, we can be. It's great. Not that far away yeah. to be able to yeah. do something. Yeah. All right. I'll just say if something falls through within six months. Again, I probably off the top of my head probably say it's a five or ten percent chance. Right. You know, we'll take it. We'll take it. But you have definitely proposed. Uh, it's not like you, you get a proposal. The proposal? The application. For the Oral War for the... Oh, yeah, he's got the permit. I think Bill's got the permit in his permit? hand. Permit? Yeah, yeah. 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 He's referring to the proposal to put out bid documents and um, basically it's a slight extra work or revision of the work that he's done. Right? Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, moving on. Um, lower gra lower wharf ship grant refund, uh, Mr. Stedman. Ms. Gabriel has done a terrific job by assembling all of the invoices and <laughs> payments uh, as requested by the court of uh, Bill's left. Um, he was searching. He, he was away for a week, but he was doing a tabulation of the hours that he spent uh, on the project. 
and also the hours that the purchasing department spent on, on the project before we knew we couldn't do, do the dredging project. Should we just quickly, why are we, we have money to dredge to the award to us, or to the HMC in 2019? 2017. 2017. And for a variety of reasons, all of which were beyond our control, we were unable to do the dredging. And the dredging was not going to be in the channel, it was going to be around where the dinghy dock is, and over in that area of the, of the harbor. We were unable to do the dredging. We thought we would be able to repurpose the money to do the lower war project that we now have the permit for, and the Connecticut Port Authority told us after consulting with the Bond Commission that that money had been bonded only for dredging, only in that part of the harbor, and we have to return it. So now we have about a quarter of a million dollars that we have to return to them, and they've allowed us to um, deduct expenses that were related to that project. And Betty and Jeff have been working diligently to document the, those expenses so that we get to keep that money and the balance is returned to Connecticut Port Authority. So this, this particular grant, at, at that time, the Port Authority gave a check for the amount to the town up front, and it was $266,000. We were not able to use that through no fault or issues of, of our own. Uh, we, we, as Kim said, we thought we would be able to repurpose it on further dis, uh, review by the Port Authority. They said no. Um, so now we've, we've gone through this accounting and, and return an, an amount. Uh, the future grants from the, the Port Authority, including if, if there is another round of grants, that, such as we would hope to get for the lower work project, those, those grants will not be, will not include funds provided up front. They'll be reimbursable <laughs> grants. We'll get an invoice from a contractor that we would. So, so we, 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 I shouldn't say we, I mean, I sat at the table while Betty did all the work. Uh, we, we've uh, accounted for the invoices to race and my, my work and now we're going, we're going to incorporate the, the town's work, uh, and then we'll submit it. And we, and we also wrote a report explaining you know, why, what, what the purpose of the whole project was and why we couldn't do it. And for the commission members, the reason we couldn't do it is that even though it was a small amount of dredge material or material to be dredged, it, was, it had contaminants in it or has, has contaminants in that part of the harbor, and it required another dredging project from somewhere else to cap it but there were no other dredging projects from anywhere else in Long Island Sound that could cap it. So we, we couldn't do the work and the permit expired. Um, so instead of trying to get another permit for dredging with no hope that we could do the project, we switched our, our focus to, to uh, the, the uh, repair of the wall and, and, the, and the pier. So we'll get this out before the next meeting. Great. Any questions? Yeah, can you can you elaborate on that capping? I think that yeah, like so, so we cap it. We can't cap it with the other dredging project we have coming up. Well, and I can talk about this this too. But the, the answer, my understanding, and what I've been told is no, because because the capping material is not considered a beneficial use of dredge material. So if the material is sand and it can be used on the beach or for some other beneficial purposes, such as for enhancing shellfish beds, that's what it has to be used for. It can't be used for cap material. That that that's that's the way we follow this. But in any event, we can't do it now because we don't have the permit for it. Sure. So we had a permit. We renewed. We renewed the permit. <laughs> we renewed the permit several times. We, we renewed it several times, and then they finally said that they wouldn't renew it anymore. And if we wanted to renew it, we had to retest the the sediment. We had to retest it. The retesting alone but, but was going to be. We, actually, you take it back. We did retest the sediment. Right. Because we were wondering if, if perhaps if we retested the sediment, the, 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 the new data would show that it was maybe better than it was seven or eight or ten years ago, and we could put it in the Western Long Island Sound disposal site, which wouldn't require a cap. And when we retested it, it was worse than it was ten years ago. How, how that happened, I don't, I don't know. So. Uh, the other thing is, New York State will oppose capping as practice now. So that the permit that we had 
prior to New York State's opposition. Yes. We were grandfathered with respect to the New York State's concerns. Now we did it. So it's not a feasible thing to think about now. Unfortunately. We certainly have to think ahead in terms of planning and what we put in our management plans as to what's the future of that area down there. So, Betty, can you help me out with the accounting of this? So we have this grant money in a separate account in this town accounting system with a balance, which is equal to the amount of the grant, I assume. Yes? Minus all the expenditures to date. But not these expenditures? No. We've taken the money out. So these are deductions that have already been made for that account? Yes. Okay, so we're just documenting previous deductions. Yes. So when we give the money back, they're going to get the balance of what's in the account. That's correct. That's these items which we've enumerated here. Yes. Plus the town engineer's hours and the purchasing department. So we're going to document those hours. Correct. And so what's going to happen with respect to the value of the dollars of the town departments? Are we going to refund them to the departments? No. So are we still going to have, the question I'm really getting to, are we going to have a balance left in this account? No. So where's that money going? So you have the $266. I'm going to make up a number now. It's hidden in the file somewhere. And we've had expenditures, either race, Jeff, whatever those expenditures were. So now, you know, you've got $166,000. So that's what, so we're going to document why they're only getting back the $166,000. My question is about the Bill Hurley Department and any other department. They have a value of that that's not yet reflected in the account balance at this point. Right. What's going to happen with that? That will be deducted from the $166,000 based on your conversation. They're going to allow that. And I think some of purchasing time as well, correct? I think Jack's asking, do we have to give them any money to their town? Do we do a journal voucher to move that money to those departments? Or do we keep that money in the harbor management accounts is my question. I have not heard that we need to do a journal entry on that. I think we need to have a conversation with Terry. That's a good question. So the value, I guess my question is, do we get to have some authority to control the expenditure of the portion of the town staff investments? Because we were reimbursed. So if you pay Jeff, say he charged $1,000 just to pick a number. If that came out of the harbor management account. It came out of the $266,000. account. But now the money we're returning is net of that $1,000. And that $1,000 should actually come from that town escrow account back in the $266,000 to reimburse us. As opposed to the town just getting the windfall on the money on their general fund or their general balance. Correct? I don't see a windfall except what Jack was mentioning. Well, meaning that we've spent money out of the $266,000 that we had a grant for, but we're not replenishing that money in the account where it came from. In fact, it's just going to the town into the general fund. It's already expended. It's going back to the port of the way. No, 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 no. So let's just say that we gave you $1,000 out of the harbor management account, I think is what Jack is saying. So we wrote a check for $1,000 to you out of that account. But now we have this pile of money sitting in the town that was $260,000 that we only have to give back $265,000. We get to keep the $1,000 that we paid you. So instead of that $1,000 just going to the town general fund, should it not get put back into the $266,000 account that it came out of, I think is the question. It's already been drawn again. The money has already been taken out of the account, whatever this account is called, and that's gone. My question was about the funds that were actually expended by departments for their time. Time. And are they going to ask the Harbor Management Commission bond or grant account to reimburse them, or do we get to keep that money for Harbor Management? That's a very good question. That money is under our control, the net of the $266,000. It's not just sitting in a town. No, we have those multiple accounts. Oh, that's a different question. I didn't realize that. They weren't filling our account. That's your question, right? We have a separate account that's only got the Harbor Management account with the $266,000 ship grant in it. And so I think Jack's question is, we've already paid. What happens to that money that Bill Hurley is saying is 
is his his the value of it the time that he spent on that project. That's my question. Okay. Are we going to give that money back is to that the going or the general or fund? Do we keep, do we keep all it? the town's investment in this project? Do we give do we Bill a check? What? We, we never been asking for it. We never talked about the finance schedule. Well, I think, but because we're, coordinator. because we're working with the grant coordinator, the town's grant coordinator, I'm sure she has a plan. Okay. I'm sure she has a plan. This is not, this is not just Betty, Jeff, and Kim sending out the check. It's going to go through the town's grant coordinator and the finance department. But they do workforce, other, other workforce. For example, the, the engineering department just did a survey of, of Satsco Hill Beach right. as part of the federal project. Okay. So that work has all been done as part of the town, their overall service to the town. They're, they're not billing us for that. Exactly. It's, it's part, of their, part, of their, part of their job to right. help. Town, town commissions and agencies, and that's Got what it. I assume this, this would be. So, I'm afraid there's no windfall for us. We didn't, we're not going to make money on the deal. Yeah. It's going to go back to the town general fund in some some shape, way, shape, or form. I'm not sure to the 102 account, for example. Yeah, no. No, no, it's gone. Any other questions about the ship grant refund? How we got here, what we're doing? Um, and then finally, lower, one final lower wharf issue, risk assessment uh, and rules. Mr. Hyman. Yes. Uh, I spoke with Peter Ritchie today, our risk manager, who, by the way, is, as you're talking about new employees, he joined the town in October of, uh, of last year. So he's kind of new to things, too, and that may have played a role in his, uh, in some of the, Lack of information he had about our role in uh, managing Lower Wharf and some of the delays. It has been seven months since the uh, storm damaged Lower Wharf, and there, except for one small sign that is on the on the structure itself. That's all there is. In any event, uh, what we came up with after talking through the the history of it and the sequence of, what, of what's going on. He's prepared to, to convene a meeting uh, with the Harbor Management Committee subcommittee, which would be uh, myself, uh, George, and... And Eric Sunderman. And Eric Sunderman. Um, and with uh, himself, Parks and Recreation, uh, and DPW. He's prepared to organize that meeting. Uh, and the purpose of that meeting would be to plan the path for the signage process, let's call it, because it's 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 evolving uh, as we as we speak in some ways. Uh, but certainly there has to be agreement on what the content of any signs might be. Uh, signs plural. Uh, most of the risks are pointed out in this very. Easy to read risk assessment report, and it could be as simple as that. Uh, but because of where it's going, uh, there's sensitivity with the historic district commission and so forth. What I propose is that we put together a, a path, a plan, a draft of the content, what it might look like, and then talk about that informally with the historic district commission and perhaps others. And say, is this this is kind of what we're thinking of, you know, and, and try to get a preliminary read from them on what they would be comfortable with, uh, because I think that uh, they're very, let's just say, particular, uh, and I'd rather get their guidance and feedback before we finalize anything, and then come to them with something that's been kind of blessed. I think that'll be easier. Great. Um, and there may be others along the way, Sasquatch Association or others, uh, that need to, that could also have particular points of view on signage on, on that land because it is what it is to all of us. And so it's kind of consulting with them in the process uh, rather than surprising them with a done deal. Great. You know? Um, we did talk about dogs, and I actually had a brief conversation with Jen Carpenter upstairs. The risk assessment has gone to, I'll call them physical risks, you know, the, the uneven land, electrical outlets that were out there, a dangerous pier, things like that. Simultaneous with all of the damage to lower wharf, 
there have been kind of little bits of communication we've received about dog-human problems down there. And that's a historic, long-standing conflict. But I've learned that it's not as big as I feared. There was one person, and only one, according to Jen, who made a sign, who, who made a complaint to Brenda Kupchik about poor dog behavior down there. He has not come back and made any additional complaints. Then there was the anonymous letter from the Southport Neighborhood Association that also referred to things. She has not heard from them, and she could not, Jen could not follow up with them because we don't know who them is. Um, so the the dog, you know, the dog human dog owner responsibility, uh, dog waste issue, any of that dog bite issue, is not a big issue. <laughs> it's it, there, you know, there have been there was one person who made a complaint, and then there was the anonymous complaint. So uh, I had feared that it was more substantial than that. I think we need to focus mostly on the physical issues that are pointed out in the risk assessment report and um, maybe let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions for Don? I, I do have to get uh, what Peter Ritchie, the uh, risk manager, asked me is to get the names of the people who are coming to this meeting that I just described, and he wants time, an okay time availability for that. So I'll speak with each of you, you know, after, and we'll get... Great. I need some days that uh, are good for that kind of a meeting. Great, and so you'll have, hopefully that'll happen before the August meeting. That would be nice. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. That would happen then, and, and I, he wants to keep the town attorney informed, too. Great. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Any questions for Don? Terrific. Great, great, great. Okay, sand management. Uh, Jeff? Well, you said <clears throat> primarily the hard drinking project, and I you know, work with the Corps of Engineers to accomplish this. Um, I, I've been talking with Hugh Siligato, who's the project manager, and as Devin mentioned, the Corps seems to be understaffed in, in a lot of different ways. but. My conversations with her recently have been positive. Uh, that, that, that they believe, uh, I was told, that, that, that they can reach agreement with DEEP that we don't have to put the sand on the beach, that we can put it offshore. And even if it's not going to stay in place for use to improve shellfish habitat, it's still within the littoral area. The sand naturally drifts from east to west. Um, and Part of that, the, the, their optimism for that is, and, and thank you, thanks to the town, um, the, the survey crew did a topographic survey of Sasco Hill Beach uh, and compared it to, the town has something called an engineered beach permit that I believe Devin, Devin worked on. And that, that, that allows the town to maintain a profile of the beach, a desired or, or most desired amount of sand and, and profile. So the survey that the engineering department just did for last month or whenever shows that there's more sand than, than is called for in the engineered beach permit. So there is no need to put more sand on, on the beach. So that, that, that was a, a big help to us. Uh, they, they can also go and survey Southport Beach, but that, that, that just doesn't seem to be reasonable to think we could truck the sand down there. So, that, so that's, that's good news. What the Corps of Engineers is working on now are the real estate issues, uh, and that includes the ownership of, uh, of, the sand, of the area that's going to be excavated, since that's now well above mean high water. But in addition to that, and, and their real estate section is working on that, in addition to that, and I, I don't understand all of this, but and, and I, I sent the agreements that we previously had with the Country Club of Fairfield for access through their property. And those agreements were simple memorandums that were signed by the first selectman at the time, the chairman of the Harbor Commission, and the president of the country club. But if the federal government is going to access through someone's property, they, they need a more formal agreement than just, you know, we can sit together and work out. So that, that requires, a, uh, I don't know if it requires an easement, but that's what they're, they're thinking about. And if that's the case, 
the legal, the, the time it takes to develop that is, is a potential concern. Um, but I also, again, I, I updated our, our presentation on the history of the navigation project. By updating, I just changed, added the, the new names on the, on the commission to the acknowledgments and updated the dates. Uh, and to say that we're now working to complete the, the, the dredging plan. And the Corps asked if I could send that to them again, which I did, along with the historical documents that we obtained from the National Archives and the State Library. And, and, those, and then to, to summarize, to, to this, the authorization of the jetty and the wall, and these, these are related to the researching and making a determination of the ownership. It started in, in 1829 when the federal government passed an act authorizing the construction of the jetty and the wall. And that was based on a survey and a plan that the Army engineers had done the year before. But, but in order to build that, just like in order to build federal lighthouses and, and other works, they needed the, 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 the property interest from the state of Connecticut. So the federal act was March of 1829. In May of 1829, there was a special act of the, of the Connecticut legislature authorizing the governor to transfer the state's interest in the underwater land to the federal government as necessary to build those structures. And that, was, and that specifically called for the governor to do this with a deed of session, C-E-S-S-I-O-N. -S and then right after that, the governor did. Uh, by deed of session, transfer the, the, uh, the state's property interest to the, to the federal government for building the wall and the jetty. And then we looked up, you know, what, what's, the def what's the legal definition of a deed of session? And it's, it's the transfer of property rights from one governmental entity to another. So that, that's part of the, of the back, background for all of this. So I'll, I'll keep talking with them, but right now there's nothing more that we, than we, have, that we have to do uh, unless in the near, oh, oh, and they, they've also almost completed, they said, or have a, a good way into the completion of the environmental impact evaluation for this project. It's a federal project. They don't have to do a, an environmental impact statement because it's not a new project. It's a maintenance of an existing one. So they're working on completing the environmental impact evaluation now. And then when all this is put together, then, then they, they will submit an application to DEEP for, for approval. And whether we need deep to come down here or not, that, that, that's still to be determined. Any, any, any hints from them about timing of any of this? The concern I have about the timing is when, when they talked about this easement or legal agreement with the country club for, for access through their property. Because the access to the property is for the purpose of bringing excavating equipment. <coughs> well, I don't think they can get it down the, 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 off of the Sasko Hill Road. That turn is too steep. They may have to bring it along from, from Sasko Hill Beach like the town did. But, but the, the purpose of that equipment is that the dredge itself can't dig the whole amount of sand out and can't shape the side slope. So that they would be, they would need to bring excavating equipment that the core would use. Right. Just, just like in that, they, they, I sent the pictures. I think him from Green Harbor or Greens Harbor in Massachusetts, Great, yeah. where they would be loading sand in, into the hopper of the uh, of the dredge. So that's that's what we're we're working on. Do we know if they've contacted the country club or are they still they, internally? They, 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 internally, they want to. Okay. They have to determine, in addition to the. <clears throat> The, the, the easement or whatever the agreement is, there's, there's, there's a, a, a question on the application to DEEP about the ownership of the, the area that you're working on. And that, that's what they said that they're working to make a On the ownership. Any questions for Jeff? But we also have to thank, the, again, the, the engineering department for going out and doing that yeah, survey. Yeah, uh, doing that survey. I mean, that of the big issue. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, morning committee. Uh, yes, I, I don't really have this. You want to report that we, you met? We met? Uh,
Yes, uh, we met last week on Tuesday, oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Jeff Warren is uh, be leading the uh, more Committee on a go-forward basis. Um, we talked about the topics that were uh, already discussed by the Harbor Master, and um, I, I can't recall anything else but, but beyond the scope of that. We mainly discussed the derelict vessel. We talked about the derelict, he talked about the derelict right. vessel. Uh, nothing in addition to the no, Nothing in addition to the <clears throat> Okay. All righty. Um, the question about the language and condition five of the permit for the fixed pier. Um, it's on the, we can go back to the chairman's report number two. How do you feel about that language, which goes back to suggesting that we have keelboats? So the concern is disrupting the shellfish beds. Well, the shellfish commission is not concerned. They've said they're not concerned. Right. The question that that's before us is: Do we the the permit as issued, Mr. Russo? You please correct me if I'm incorrect. The permit issued said only basically only kayaks, paddle boards, et cetera, will will be moored, berthed, kept at the end of the pier. That's what the permit said. And shortly thereafter, the the folks who were building the dock came back to Deep and proposed this language. And Deep came to us through through race and said, "Are you guys okay with this?" We responded, "No, we don't like the idea of anybody with any kind of anything that would dig into the sand to be at that." end of that pier, the Shellfish Commission came back and said, this language here, they're okay with. So the question is, because we have to respond to DEEP, are we okay with this? But that was our initial concern. Yes. Yeah. Jim, yeah. this is Doug. Can you hear me? Hey, Doug. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to, to weigh in just in two areas. You know, first, I'm generally okay with the language because it really covers, you know, auxiliary power and, and other things that would be of concern. Okay. Um, concern is um, the last few lines about sail powered vessels without a fixed keel. The spirit of it reads a certain way in this, but a literal interpretation might also include a very large sailboat with a centerboard or something, um, or a lifting keel or, or something else. Yep. So I might suggest we just adopt language on the last few words. Um, for my example, the or a sail-powered vessel of less than 15 feet without a fixed keel. But for the, for the benefit of the group, I'm just choosing 15 feet because I know, you know, a laser is 13 feet and change, a sunfish is 13 feet and change. You know, the, the recreational type sailboats that I think would be fine in that area are, you know, tend to be dinghies, right? Um, and so the, the basis for the 15 feet, is, or we could even just maybe classify it as a dinghy. <laughs> Um, so that somebody doesn't get, you know, a 50-foot sailboat with a lift and keel. I see a lot of heads nodding, Doug. Commissioners, you want to put your nods into words? Well, can I just say that yeah. what was brought up at the Shellfish Commission? What, what was brought up? The, about size of boat. Okay. We felt that it, it was not a fixed keel, that it would still be okay. And so we did this cut back. Um, and, and that... It just, can, Doug, can you hear Mr. Russo? Yeah, I think you just said the, self, the shellfish commission, the sentiment at the shellfish commission was if it was not a fixed keel, it would still be okay. Good. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I Is that what I was hearing? Because there was talk about, you know, what are the sizes of some boats, and, you know, the sailboats are not necessarily the size of the boat that was built here. Um, and so we just felt that, you know, the size of the boat that was built here. And they voted on it um, was that they didn't need that. It, 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 as long as it said that there would not be a fixed keel, um, they felt then that they didn't need to put in a limit on the length. Well, so the, the, the only comment I would make, and I, I, I might be, you know, again, just targeting the loopholes here is on the one hand, a very large boat with a lifting keel or a center board would probably fall into the clause number three about auxiliary powered sailing vessels. Mm -hmm. um, 
But uh, when I was running Morris, we had a very well-heeled customer who had a house in the Bahamas and had limited depth and other things. And, and we designed for that customer a 52-foot sailboat that could get to a shallow depth of four feet with the keel up. Uh, not that boat had an engine. But so I was only trying to, you know, think through the, the loophole that somebody with, you know, resources and creativity might try and sure. create. Sure. But it, it, it gets back to how this original, this whole thing originally started was when we first went for the DAC approval, there was the talk with the Shellfish Commission about how motorized vessels were not appropriate there. Because there was a concern, the main concern was the disruption that could come from an engine, um, but then also the danger to the shellfish if there was some type of oil or gas leak. So when we first got the original draft of the uh, the approval for the dock, it just said no motorized vessels. And then when we got the final approval, which was a couple months later, it divided the what was prohibited. It said no motorized vessels, no auxiliary power sailing vessels, which would make sense because that. They didn't want to, to end around the motorized vessel ban. And then it said sailing vessels. And that was the part that surprised us. And that's why we went and asked to amend the language. When I talked with the Shellfish Commission, I asked them, I said, are you, are you, were you concerned with a boat resting on the bed or really just concerned with the engine? And they expressed to me that the concern was with the engines and the possible damage that an oil spill could have on the bed, and that they weren't so much concerned with uh, a boat resting on the bed. They also said that this, this is not an area where they stock particularly, so it is not in an active shell fishing area for them. But if there was an oil leak there, that could, even really? though it's right, it's not on top of the bed really, it's not where they stock, that could still have a big impact on the bed. Sure. George, you had a comment? No, just that there are boats bigger than catamarans, monohulls that can have a swing keel. Um, what, what is our purview as to protecting this area? Or, or why, why? Because the shellfish we, commission uh, has, has, has the shellfish beds are right there just just north of where the pier will be. This is unprotected water in the open sound. And the question is, what kind of boats in the harbor management area do we want attached to a small dock in open water in a hurricane or whatever else? There's, right. no, there's no moorings allowed there. That's forbidden right. in our rules right. and procedures. Right. Right. So this is a, the first time we've been presented with a proposal to put. And so the question is, they want unlimited length Sailing powered vessels, sail powered vessels, sail vessels. No, no auxiliary power without a fixed keel, but no weight, no weight, no length limitation, no size limitation. Um, the only limitation is it can't have a fixed keel, so it's just have to have dagger boards or. or Kevin, there's a lot of limitations that are imposed just just by the site itself, as you know, Jack, the exposure and the depth. It's going, to, it's going to be somewhat self-limiting. I think what it's going to do on here is doing. It, we don't want it to be unreasonably limited. The, the limitations of the site itself are going to impose limitations on what can come and go. The limitations with respect to uh, potential um, oil or gas releases are, are picked up with respect to power or auxiliary power. Now we have, we have this, this narrow little sliver that that's remaining. That I, I don't. There's nothing that we're going to do in this room that's going to stop anyone from navigating over that patch of water anyway. It's still open right. open water. They kept there. Someone that might be coming and going to there might know that body of water better than others. I, I don't think the boats that are going to go there are going to be that big. Even if if they are a larger lift keel or, or, or centerboard sailboat, the, the rudders are going to be a concern for draft. There's not. We, we don't have four feet there. We have. I think we have 12 inches there. At low tide. At low tide. Yeah. So I, I think that I think the real constraints are. It's it's sight. Those constraints are real. I think the concerns with the protection of the resource that we picked up through the harbor management. I'm sorry, the uh, shellfish commissions. 
comments. Um, and I think uh, maybe there's a maybe there's a Kobe cat there that's 21 feet long someday. I, I, don't, I don't I don't I don't know, but I I think we in this room none of us know. And I think from a I think reasonable limitations have been placed on it to protect the resources. And I think uh, I think we're asking to. I mean, you essentially just have like a death wish for your boat if you, if, if which, and with going with that much capacity, would want to, I mean, you would be just comfortable with your boat being damaged. So yeah. I, I, I think the, the owner of the boat's uh, uh, drive to protecting their boat would keep, would just prevent them from locating it here. And it wasn't enough now. Yeah. Jeff? Seven? Did Deep tell you what the process is? Because this this is an approved permit with a condition right. in it. Yeah, so they would, would amend the license. They, they would amend the license, right. so they they have a procedure to follow, and there it is, but it, it doesn't require another public notice. It does. It does. It does you know, they would just amend the language of the license. Okay. And frankly, the original license didn't really reference the conditions, so they said that they would. They would reference the conditions in the amended notice, so it would, but, but it would better state what the what the restrictions and the conditions. But they are. specifically asked for comments from the Harbor Commission and the Shellfish Commission before making a decision. Correct. So that maybe that's what we should understand is in the future, if there's a if there's a license that's issued with conditions in it, based on this precedent, that, that it shouldn't be amended unless the, the the Harbor Commission has the opportunity to make a comment. Yeah. Important to important to remember, yeah. Uh, there and was another issue where I it had nothing to do with you, where, where we brought this up, and they said they didn't have a procedure for amending uh, permit conditions. Yeah, I, I talked to Colin Clark at Deep uh, last week, and, and that's what he, he yeah. said he had talked to his supervisor about it, and that's what they would do. Doug, what were you what were you suggesting? I've lost what you were suggesting. Fifteen feet, just have a, a length. I, a length limitation. Oh. Uh, I was suggesting a qualifier that was a length limitation. So, you know, it could be a type of boat like a, like a dinghy or 15 feet. And I was, and I was basing the 15 feet on just, you know, the, the types of boats that would be, you know, if you read the sentence uh, following human powered vessel, you know, rowboats, canoes, kayaks, paddle boards. Uh, I think an expectation would be if somebody had a, you know, a Vanguard 15, a sunfish, a laser, a sailboat, um, something of, of that type. Um, would you know could do it uh, i don't know whatever the, the appropriate length limitation is the other side of it is that clause number three that that suggests auxiliary power with sailboats right uh something that would be larger than that uh center board or not would probably have auxiliary power right or require it it'd be highly unusual if somebody brought in a you know a 30 or 40 foot boat with a dagger board and no engine So, Commissioner, thoughts? Here's here's one other thought, which might help capture the spirit of it. Mm -hmm. Go which ahead. Is the same the same way there are parenthetics in the first part of that last sentence, you know, that's showing rowboats, canoes, kayaks. Uh huh. We could say sail powered vessels without a fixed keel, parentheses, sunfish, laser, et cetera. Limited to. No, no, right. just the, 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 the last. The, the I, I just mean, I, you know, IE. And, and so, you know, I would I think if, if somebody the was going to challenge it or get legal, that the spirit of it would be looked at. And so, um, because of the strength, I think, of number three, just another qualifier would, would demonstrate the type of boat, sunfish, laser, Hobie cat, et cetera. It would, it would capture it the same way that there's a qualifier for human powered vessels in the first part of that sentence. So that, that's an additional consideration. I, I just, because uh, there's so many different types of seal, I Well, I think we would include it, not, not we, we would say, for example, but not limited to sunfish lasers. I mean, I guess the, the question is how you know it leaves it so much up to interpretation. Yeah, how the state would take that. Well, sail-powered vessels without a fixed keel, you know, is is a 
fairly clear definition, I guess, if we were to say IE, sunfish, laser, Hobie's had, et cetera, it's demonstrating a type of vessel without restricting it to just those three boats, predictors and et cetera there. Frank, frankly, I think the paragraph is probably fine as it is because okay. it covers auxiliary power and sail power, but if we wanted to have just some more detail to make sure. I mean, I guess all I can say is that our position, we totally understood, you know, and understand with the, the commission being, you know, I guess I remember the meeting that we were here where we first talked about it, about referring it out to the Shellfish Commission, and this commission saying that they were very sensitive to wanting to get feedback from the Shellfish Commission. And they've given it. So, I mean, and, and they're really, the, I guess, the potential to be most impacted. And so that's why, you know, we, we met with them, we worked on this language, we talked about this language, and they agreed to it, which is why we think, you know, what's being presented is, is sufficient. Um, they knew that, you know, a boat could, if it, it was a sailboat, that it could, if it was, it was moored, that the bottom could touch the bed, and, and they were comfortable with that. Well, I guess our, we, we certainly are concerned about the Shellfish Commission, but the ultimate authority is right here, and I think we want to be sure that we're, we're, we're thought about all the possibilities. I mean, we're putting a dock in a place where there's never been a dock. We're putting a, a you know, allowing um, um, the, the possibilities are, you know, kind of re remarkable and endless. We don't really know what to expect. I mean, it, you're right, Devin, the, the conditions will certainly limit a lot that can go on there, but also we've had a lot of experience with um, uh, being being um, called to task by people who have lots of money and want what they want when they want it. And I guess we don't. I, I, I guess I don't want to set set up a situation where a future harbor commission is responding to a um, request from somebody that that we none of us then then or now think would be appropriate for that spot. And I think that's what we're struggling with, not... not. The only thing I can think of that in this region that's similar to this is on, on Beachside Avenue, the people who built the elevator to raise their power boat across, out, out of the water so it's, you know, 30 feet above, above the water. So the, that, that's out of the water. This person is proposing in shallow water and in Long Island Sound, in open water, to put a boat dock and to keep a boat vessel, a vessel there. Right. That Right, well, and that's what they're proposing. Uh, I, I think they can't keep the vessel there. They can, they can touch and go. They can. They, it says if there's nothing here. It says they can't keep it there. At no time shall any motorized vessel, fixed kill sailing vessel, or be berthed at, moored at, or otherwise secured right, to. Right, those are the ones that can't be, but that presumes that everybody, every, anything that doesn't fall under it can be. So my, my, my understanding is that it's going to be there all the time. But for his point that using poor judgment of the yeah. storm is coming. But, right. but I, I just don't know any other similarly right. situated docks in Long Island Sound. Well, there's, there's, there's two on Beachside Avenue. There's a number on Long Neck Point, Darien, on both sides. Um, Stratford went through this, uh, so the commission with Jeff, when it was one proposed and authorized on uh, Long Island Sound side. So it, it occurs. Yeah. I, 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 of those that I've listed, I've been involved in a number of them. I've never seen conditions uh, as tightly written as this. And I'm not saying good, bad, or different. And again, I, I don't think we've had one that was immediately adjacent to the shellfish uh, bed. So the shellfish interests seem to be satisfied. And I, I guess, from my perspective, I think I think that the site conditions will dictate what will go there. I think conditions will, will, will further refine that. I, I don't think you can bring anything bigger even if you have uh, well, a lifting heel the water would break off. Right. I guess what I guess Doug all, uh, Doug had a situation where somebody did bring a big big boat into very shallow water. And I, I think that's probably what we're all struggling with is not not what's here but it's sort of the what ifs and is there any way uh, are, 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 is there something else we should be thinking about? Like a 28-foot catamaran could be beached there during low tide with the rudders up if they had no auxiliary 
motor, it would be legal, correct? Right. Or a 50 foot one, same situation. Right. Right. That's where I took to the point that maybe we should just use some examples of what we mean. May not, it may not be, it may not be capturing all the possibilities, but it certainly suggests what we have in mind. You could also drop an Well, and, and the, the comment about us bringing up this language before. Uh, Doug, I'm sorry, start again. So the comment about us, you know, working on this language and submitting it, I think if this is an adoption of our language, right, that we're looking at, that we'd previously submitted? No, this is, this is, this is proposed language from the, from the applicant. Okay, so it, it does not, it, it doesn't include recommended language from us. Um, Correct. You know, the comment on, on the, 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 the 28 foot catamaran, which is totally valid, I think it also would be unusual that a, a catamaran of that size wouldn't have some sort of auxiliary power. Um, but you know that's that's the risk. So um, yeah. we we could we could try and qualify it just to to mitigate it. See some heads nodding. I don't see any harm in doing what Doug suggests, which is to use some um, examples of the kind of vessels that we contemplate, because yeah. uh, we can't predict what somebody might be able to design, but we know that that property is going to be purchased by some, some means. So I don't think we foresee 50-foot vessels without it being there, but we could make it clear that that's what our expectations are for future Harbor Management Commission. Yeah, you know, another thought, too, just in terms of what I was saying about size as I'm thinking about it, you know, a Hobie Cat 16 is a very popular boat would probably be fine. We see them all over Fairfield uh, and, and the waterways that, that we're in right now, even maybe an 18. So uh, I think we could either specify both types um, or I might say, you know, even taking that 15 feet up to something like 20 feet or 18 would probably, in my opinion, would be acceptable because, again, we're trying to catch spirit here. If somebody had a, a, a Hobie 16 there, um, it, I imagine would probably be fine for the, the purpose and what we're trying to accomplish. Jeff, are you Stephen, wanting to weigh in? I don't want to. Might I ask a, a question? Uh, the other properties, the other, including the waterfront properties, are they now being offered for sale as, as one group of properties, or are they being offered for sale individually? Individually, they're offered for sale individually. Yes, a couple of them sold. Yes. Okay, and and what, when they when they were offered, was it was it made clear that that, that that there was a condition that there could be no docks? Yes. From from those properties. The association docks. Um, it's on the title for all lots. Um, it's in the ask the tuck restriction, um, and it's in the um, subdivision conditions. In the subdivision conditions, but the people who bought the, the properties in say and the, and the ones that are still for sale, that, that's with the mm -hmm. clear, clear expression that, that, that the, yeah, so the property does not have one dock is allowed all right. out of all those seven properties. Um, and that that particular location was chosen once, but that it's a location of a former um pier, yeah. and um, and also there is no waterfront on the seven lots, but the entirety of it um, that wasn't on the shellfish bed, the borders of the shellfish bed. So there was nowhere we could have put it to avoid the shellfish bed. So what about it, commissioners? Is it put a size limitation or let the let the language, approve the language as, as it's been proposed? Is that the concern that a larger size vessel would be irresponsible? I mean, I think that's what I'm getting because, you know, we addressed the concern of the Shellfish Commission. It was really chemical and not mechanical when it's open water. But I think the sentiment of, of us here or, or most are that a larger size vessel would be irresponsible in open water. We right. don't allow moorings in this area for the same reason that I'm anxious about having large vessels tied to a dock in open ocean, open water, not ocean, but open water. So, so that's the answer. So we got to limit the size of the vessel. So the, so the idea was suggested earlier, parentheses such as 
for uh, I'm uncomfortable with that too. I mean, just an array of things that, that make it very clear we're not talking about some enormous trimaran or catamaran happens to have no engine. Or put a limitation on the length of the vessel. You can do that. We can do that too. That would probably be the best way to do it. Clear cut, right? So to take away all the nuances. So, you know, up to 20 feet or 25 feet or whatever, whatever. You guys feel more comfortable. I'm not a sailor, so you know these vessels better than I right. Like folks have said, it's hard to imagine a 25 foot sailing vessel that an auxiliary engine. I kind of agree with what Kevin said. Is that the site itself is preventing, sure. is preventing those large vessels? I mean, it's only 12 inches. I mean, they just can't. You can't get there's, there's nothing to prevent them from anchoring two feet off the deck anyway. Right. That's true. Right. Mm -hmm. Or anyone. It's true. Yeah, that's true. So I would keep the language as it is. I think I think it complies with the Shellfish Commission and the site prevents the other things that we're concerned about. But Again, a, a comment for what it's worth. Might might you say something that, that this is make it clear that this is for this decision and it's not meant to be a set of precedent for any similar decisions or, or similar situations that may occur later on, but this is this is only with respect to this the review of this particular proposal. We can say that, but we don't have any, I mean. Our actions are our actions. Yeah. Language as it is, limit the size. I support limiting the size with an example of the crafts that we're talking about. I think that's the big concern, right? I mean, apart from all the other limitations, but who knows what means someone has to get creative. <laughs> There's been a number of examples cited. So I think we need to limit the size if, if that's a concern. If going, allowing over a certain size would be irresponsible, let's limit the size. So what size would we choose? Well, there was a suggestion of the parenthetical examples of sunfish, laser, uh, Hobie Cat, I think. Hobie, there were 16 or 18. 16 or 18. Well, we had, I think Doug was suggesting either or size or both. I was. I, we could do both. I was. Yeah. I was suggesting either or, um, for whatever it's worth, my, my preference or, or motion would be that we have or sail powered vessels without a fixed keel, parentheses, i.e., sunfish, comma, laser, comma, Hobie cat, comma, et cetera. Sounds good. Yeah. Sunfish, Hobie, Hobie cat, laser, laser, et cetera. I think there was an, you know, i.e. 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 Yeah, I.E. And then it follows the protocol of the first part of the sentence there. Yeah, it's consistent with uh, so I period, E period, sunfish, comma, laser, comma, Hobie cat, comma, et cetera, period, and parentheses. Initial cat. I remember the topography. The, the, all of those could be pulled up onto land if there's a storm coming. That's, that's right, right? In right. That, in that mm -hmm. location, which would be a good thing. Yeah, it's rocky, but you could, yeah. but you could get them out of there. I mean, because... Mm -hmm. These little boats in the storm, you wouldn't want to be sailing them to safer right. places. Right. Okay. That sounds good. So we have we have a, a suggestion that uh, after um, after uh, number two of that language, right, with fixed keel sailing vessel, no time showing motorized, no time showing any one motorized vessel, two fixed keel sailing vessel. No, that's not where it goes. No, it goes at the very end. At the very end. At the very end. After, after sure. sail powered yeah. vessels. Yeah. You would insert it after, I think, right? Yeah. E -G, after sail e -G, powered vessels. E I.E. uppercase S. Sunfish, comma. Sunfish, comma. Hobie, cat, laser, Ho et cetera. Hobie, cat, comma, laser, comma, et cetera. And I, and I think I would actually put it after the words without a fixed keel in the end there. Yeah. yeah, but I think it probably doesn't matter. It, it probably doesn't matter, but I think the, the point is they're saying a, a sail-powered vessel without a fixed keel, i.e., sunfish, Hobie cat, laser, etc. And those are brands, so they would need to be uppercase. Right. So, commissioners, how do you feel about that? Do we have a motion? Do we want to? 
I would support that. So move. I, I mean, I, I sure I, I I would make the motion for that Doug, language. Doug moves. Don seconds. Any any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? I'll abstain. Okay. <laughs> Chance will abstain. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we will get back. It's on us to get back to deep. Yeah. I could connect you with Colin Clark. If you do, I don't know if you have Colin's emailing. Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Um, and the final uh, item under old business is the uh, Harbor Management Plan Update Committee. Uh, we've met twice. We have um, identified. Um, we, we continue to. We continue to hope that we will be able to get a draft of the plan to deep uh, sometime this summer, uh, and then of course it will then go to um, then go to the RTM for their approval. Jeff is working. The last chapter we reviewed was Chapter Two. Uh, we all helped Jeff out with some comments, and he is working diligently on it. We also identified some areas of, um, uh, of areas of issues that we wanted to be sure uh, were, were were included in the plan. Uh, among those among those issues were how we were going to take care of the possibility of um, electric powered vessels. Um, we are waiting for. Um, Clim uh, another issue was what are we going, going to, we've got to talk about climate change and the possibility of flooding, diversion of water, which is currently uh, occurring. Aquarian takes seven and a half gallons, 14 and a half gallons, 14 and a half, 14 million, sorry, 14 million gallons of water from the Mill River every day to head down to the west part, the east, west part of the state. Um, we want to uh, at least mention that in the harbor management uh, plan going forward. Um, and um, all of those, um, we decided that it would probably be a good idea to mention that in the harbor management plan that we should have uh, standing committees that deal with the lower wharf as well <laughs> as uh, sand management in addition to just a uh, standing committee of a uh, of the Moor Standing Committee, which is the Mooring Committee, um, and we are still hoping to have a dredging plan that comes from the Army Corps of Engineers that will also be included in the uh, updated harbor management plan for future generations of people who needed to who need to dredge. So, um, Jeff. Well, th thank you. And I, I should have finished that issues issues paper by now. But this is related to our concerns about the authority of the Harbor Management Commission, or what we do in the Harbor Management Plan. And, and that's in response to a recent, well, last year, court decision that ruled that a Harbor Management Commission has no legal authority to make recommendations to DEEP, which is contrary to the basis of all Harbor Management Plans. So as you know, we, we attempted, you know, as we call, not to say we, other Harbor Management Commissions, to achieve a, an amendment to the, to the Harbor Management Statute, uh, which did not make it out of committee, uh, in large part because deep objected. Uh, then there was an effort to try to have a, some simple language in what's called the Implementer Bill, which is the last bill passed in the legislative session. Deep objected to that too. Um, there's been several meetings with with deep management, including the bureau chief and, and the, and the uh, the division chief. They don't. They they told us, and and I, Kim, you have you haven't been involved. I, I have, and so has been a state representative from Stanford and people from Norwalk and, and Stanford and, and New London. He made the, the statement that they don't believe it's a problem. That the problem has to do with with not good co communication between deep and 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 the towns. So they were willing to have a series of meetings with representatives of the Harbor Commission to discuss ways of better improving coordination. The state representative from Stanford said that wasn't didn't make any sense. I mean, he didn't say it in, in those words, but but said that before we go out of our way to have meetings, we should at least agree on what we're trying to address in the meetings and, and what we're trying to solve. So a, an email was sent to to Dee. 
And here's what the judge said in presenting with the judge's statement that there is no legal authority for Harbor Commission to make any comments. Asking, how do you interpret this? There was no response for the three weeks. So then another email was sent last week with a copy to the state representative. Still no response. So we mentioned that there are six harbor management plans that have been in the process of being updated. And one in New London, which is being prepared, the initial plan. So the idea was, well, we'll put into the plan what DEEP has approved in other plans. That the recommendation of the commission is binding. The commission reviews applications for state permits, just like we did with this Sasko Hill Road one. And then if DEEP objects to it, then that's the argument, you know, again, for the legislative change the next session. So that's still, so we haven't heard back from DEEP with a simple question, how do you interpret this statement? So it doesn't affect what we're doing. It's just in the background. So it's still ongoing. Yes. Okay. And I have one other topic to bring up. Okay. Any questions about plan update? Sorry. Having to do with Perry Green. And talk with Bill and Mega before the meeting. So they now have, thanks to Devin, the Corps of Engineers approval for this. But they still need TPZ approval and approval from the Historic District Commission. And there's a hearing. So just to remind folks and give George, the town got ARPA money to repair the bulkhead at Perry Green. And they've come, they've submitted the permit application. They have the permit? That's what Mega said today. From DEEP and the Corps of Engineers is just that general permit has been signed off on. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. Okay. I'm sorry. But now they need TPZ approval and also approval from the Historic District Commission. So Mega said that there's going to be a public hearing by TPZ on July 25th for the Coastal Site Plan review of this. And that, to me, is problematic because the town code and the state statutes call for applications for Coastal Site Plan reviews to be forwarded to the Harbor Management Commission for review and comment 35 days prior to a public hearing on it. If you remember, we never got the Coastal Site Plan review for this Sasko Hill project. Right. So I don't know how you wish to respond. I mean, we can, the commission could write a letter to TPZ transmitting the comments that they previously made to the DEEP, but also expressing the concern that this hasn't been provided to the commission as required by the town code and the general statutes. I think that would be appropriate. I mean, this is the second time TPZ has been involved in approval of a project within our jurisdiction and hasn't sent the application or hasn't let us know about it, the first being the dock. Yeah, and not that this is a controversial project, but it's the process they haven't followed. And if there was a controversy over it, someone could argue to TPZ that their process was flawed because they didn't follow the statute in referring it to the commission. Right. So my thought was that, you know, if the commission wishes, we could reiterate the comments made on this project previously made to DEEP, but also express concern that the project wasn't provided to the Harbor Management Commission for review according to the statute, to the town code and statute. I think that sounds like a good idea. Are the commissioners on the way? Are we communicating with the planning and zoning director for the town on this? I think his name is Wendt. Yeah, Jim Wendt. Jim Wendt. But we could also send a, we could write to him and send a copy to the chair of TPZ. And they really shouldn't be having a meeting. Right. I mean, the exposure that you raised. Based on what Mager told me, that the hearing is scheduled for July 25th, if that's correct. And no application. They're actually not in compliance. They're not in compliance. I mean, the point you make is that they're opening themselves up to exposure that they didn't follow their own. Right. And that's next week. That's a week away. Right. How many days is it? How many? 35 days, you said? 35 days. 
I think we should send them a letter. If they want to go ahead and have the meeting, they're going to go ahead and have the meeting right. anyway, but at least give them a heads up that we're here. And, uh, Just didn't get it. Letter yeah. or email? Well, we'll send the letter by email, but okay. but I mean, we won't send it by U.S. mail. We'll send it by email, but um, yeah. I mean, it's because of speed. Yeah. Yeah. Check yeah. That's the time code. What's the chapter and also what statute? Do you have that? I, 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 I can, it's, um, Only if you have it handy. It's section 22A113P, as in Peter, of the general statutes. And, and doesn't it say something in chapter in chapter 24, the one that has to do with the Harbor Management Commission? Yeah, it's, in, it's in chapter 24. Sure. 24? Thank you. Okay. Jeff, can you get that to Betty later? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other qu any thoughts, questions about that? All right. One final um, item under new business. Um, the harbor master reported on the uh, the derelict uh, and abandoned boat. Uh, what he didn't report was uh, that the um, it was a was a thousand dollar project. At the end of the day, there was a, a significant cost to getting a dumpster. Uh, there's town employees. Town employees, um, time and effort involved in um, sawing the boat in half. Um, we have no money in our budget for that kind of activity, none. And um, the budget time has come and gone. We've already got our budget for 2024, but I think we want to be aware that going forward, we need to decide as a commission whether we want to ask for that kind of money from the RTM the next budget cycle and and or whether we want to use our mooring fees should we ever have to cover an expense like that. I mean, that would be the alternative. Which is what we did this time. I no, think. we did nothing this time. We did nothing this time. The town covered the cost completely. The marine unit. The marine unit. Yeah, the town asked me to cover it out of my budget and I indicated I don't have a budget with any money in it as Harbor Master. So um, that's some public works in the Marine unit picks up the cost for us. Right. If this had happened on Penfield Beach or, or in South Benson Marina, I would have been handled. Well, same thing. It would be not in our jurisdiction. Right. The yeah. only reason that we got involved was that it got towed in. Correct. But what, who would have paid for it? The town. The town. The town. Okay. Just have them towed into South Benson. Say what? You can't be to the South no matter where well, they are. You know, <laughs> take them over there. Uh, but I mean, I don't think it's—I don't know that it's an issue that we can solve right now. But I think it bears discussion and consideration. How, how many times have we encountered derelict vessels like this in the past five years? In the past 10 oh, this years? is the first time. Yeah. But I, I'm but sure some of the clerk you, said there were thousands. Yeah. 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 And 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 there's that. There was an article in the. The Connecticut, Connecticut Post, Post oh, and there was yeah. another one on one of the local Connecticut TV stations about, the, about all the abandoned boats all over the state. We talked a little bit about this at the morning. I think what we were thinking is should there just be a, a recognition in the town somewhere in the budgeting process that this is a risk and a contingency fund that you do every year in your budgeting, or, or do you just you just self insure by, by just yeah. saying if it happens, we'll deal with it. but. But there are a lot of these that happen, and, and they just leave them someplace, and somebody has to clean up the pieces. So there is no budget this time. It was relatively inexpensive, but as the Harbor Master pointed out, if you can't claim that it's literally de derelict and a danger to navigation, then it ends up becoming more expensive with a, mm -hmm. an auctioning process and all the rest of it that has to go on. So it could be thousands of dollars. It could be thousands of dollars, which... If it ends up in, if it happened in Southport, we would be responsible for it. If we put it in, if we propose it in our budget, it would cause a conversation with finance folks. And they right. would have to decide. There may not be in our budget, but it might be in somebody else's budget. Well, so, just out of curiosity, Kim, why, why, if it happened in Southport, why would it not be the responsibility of the Marine Police? We, we don't think anybody has a budget for this. Uh, yeah, no, no, because I, I realize that nobody has a budget for it. I just mean in terms of you know jurisdiction and implications, and ultimately, you know, so that's why I don't know if nobody claimed it. It would seem to me that it would become a matter for the Marine Police. Yeah, 
Well, it was a matter for the Marine Police to tow it in. After that, then, then I, I, apparently, and I don't know whether the Marine unit that ultimately paid the cost of getting rid of the boat was the Marine unit of the police, the Marine unit of the DPW, the Marine unit of, 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 the, of the Parks and Rec Department. I'm not sure which. But somebody had to pay the surveyor and the dumpster rental company. And in this time, we lucked it, it wasn't us, but yeah, yeah. I recall a similar thing a, a couple of years ago in the town of Westport, when a when a boat was abandoned and, it, and from a hurricane it had washed up on the shore. And in this case, I think across some properties and sort of took shore. And I also recall that I think it was handled by the Westport Marine Police in the town of Westport. And and maybe going forward, that's how it would happen. But I just think it's worth thinking about. Number one, do we want to include it next fall in our budget to the town, which would increase our budget and probably trigger the necessity of going before the RTM to explain why our budget was increased, number one. Or number two, how do we feel about somebody comes to us with a bill for getting rid of a, de a derelict boat in Southport, how do we feel about dipping into the account that where we have mooring fees and whether we want our mooring holders to be the ones who are ultimately responsible for the derelict? Jeff? Yeah, we're long in the discussion again, but this has come up in, in several other towns with abandoned vessels. Uh, there was an example in Norwich and also in Norwalk. And at the time, the commissions were advised by DEEP to apply to DEEP for funds for removal. Really? And there's something called the Supplemental Environmental Projects Funds, Project Fund. And that fund is, is has money that's collected from people who violate DEEP regulatory programs. Um, so DEEP felt that this was a potential source of funds that they could apply for. Then they changed their mind because they're having a discussion with the boating division about trying to, instead of deep being responsible for removing abandoned vessels, to try to do something to to the owners. But of course, the owners might not be having money. So this is still something that's being discussed with deep as to whether this is a fund that could be used for the removal of these vessels, and it depends on what the environmental impact might be. So if there's a sunken vessel that's leaking fuel, that's different than someone who just abandons it on, on, on the beach. So I, he said it recently that they've had meetings with the boating division to discuss how best to proceed yeah. with dealing with, so we don't know yet what, what they might do. Good. Do any of you remember when that barge tied up in Southport with the Family in it at had music. Years ago, yeah. The, the neutrinos. The neutrinos. Flying neutrinos. Yes. The flying neutrinos. They were there for months. I don't know how we got rid of them. They, they, they left, and it's, it's, well, I'm going to get into this. Then the boat fell apart. No, they ended up in Lake Champlain, and they, and they ran ashore in Lake Champlain, north of Burlington, and and in a storm, and they were about the. It's a long story. All right, I'm sorry I started, but yeah, yeah, I know right. it was an unwanted stressed <laughs> boat and tied up in right. Southport. Right. Right. But I, I can follow up with, with Deep again and see if they've got any that would be great. resolutions out there. That would be because great. Because they, they just allocated or agreed to, 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 I think it's $40,000 is going to the Greenwich Harbor Master. And it's interesting when they, when they provide these, these funds, the idea is to provide it to the harbor master as a state official. Then they don't, you don't have to go through the process of a municipality accepting funds and going through all the, the approvals to, to accept them. Fine. So, so, in, in so Greenwich, our harbor master has a budget he doesn't know about. Well, well if it works out. But yeah. in Greenwich, for, for a long period of time, there have been unpermitted floats that, that are used to store lobster traps. And now they're getting to the point of, of removing those. And DEEP is providing money to the harbor master through this SEP fund to do it. So it's a pen, and, and DEEP itself used that fund to remove abandoned, of an abandoned barge or barges in New Haven Harbor, uh, which, which is interesting. Hmm. But, but the point is it's, it's, uh, there may be it, some. There may be a source. Okay. What is the name of that fund? Supplemental? Supplemental Environmental Project, SEP. 
Okay. Okay. Great. Well, I've been binge watching Yellowstone, and I and I think in Montana they just have the Harbor Master towed over to the next beach. (laughs) (laughs) If only. (laughs) How do you? We've got a boat. We could do it. (laughs) (laughs) So that's the end of our agenda items. Is there any other new business anybody wants to bring up? One one thing is section twenty four dash thirteen of the town code. It says, all town commissions and departments proposing or reviewing proposals affecting the harbor management area shall notify the harbor management commission of any proposals subject to the review process at least 35 days prior to the commencement of any hearings thereon, or where no hearing is held at least 35 days prior to taking any final so action. So that's 24-13? Yes. Okay. 24-13 in the town. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Um, if there's nobody who has any new business, is there any public comment? If there's no public comment, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Jack Aye. moves. Second. Jeff seconds. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Great. See you in August.